I think this is probably going to be the last slide I'm going to show you because um, we're at the end of our hour. Is that correct, um, Claire? We have an hour of 50 minutes. Do we have a couple more minutes? Oh, yeah. Help yourself, Don. Okay. All right. So we'll show a couple more slides before I have to get to my next meeting. So this was a veterinarian that had a dog with deep pyoderma that was associated with a methicillin resistant staph. And nobody wants to use amicacin to treat staph pyoderma. I get that. But this veterinarian was willing to do it, felt it was important. So I said, okay, let's do this. If you're, you're giving it intravenously, why don't we get sequential peak and trough concentrations on your pet um, across time? Because he was planning on using this a long time to treat his patient. And, you know, I tried to talk him out of it, but he was willing to buy into it. So what I want you to see is we measured concentrations um, every couple of weeks. The dog was on the drug for a month. You can see the peak in the troughs. So and notice we got a peak sample at one hour, trough concentration at four hours. Um, we were able to calculate a half-life and you see that down here. That allowed us to calculate a KEL. We went back and plugged it into our little formulas. We got volume distribution and we got clearance. And this is really a neat um, example of what will happen to Half-Life. While it did change a little bit compared to the first day, you can see it didn't change much across time. Well, that's in part because his volume of distribution contracted, can't explain to you why. So his volume of distribution contracted a little bit, so his Half-Life became shorter. But look what's happened to his clearance. His clearance for the aminoglycoside actually decreased, which caused his half-life to stay about the same. So when I saw this, you know, I warned him at the second time, we know this clearance is getting a little bit um, less. Um, by the next week, even a little bit less. And I said, okay, we need to think about stopping. And so I finally convinced him to stop at a month out. And the dog did fine. No changes in BUN, creatinine, no casts in the urine, no changes in specific gravity. And so this led me to believe that this might be a really good tool if we wanted to look at the impact of aminoglycosides on clearance. Now, I don't want us to do this because I don't think any patient should be on aminoglycoside longer than about a week. Um, but still, that might be an important tool to use to help detect some of the changes. So um, I already showed you this case. Oh, th these are just a couple of drug interactions and shadows in the middle of my slide, and I apologize for that. But this was a dog that was put in one of our clinical trials, and uh, he was a refractory epileptic, and um, no, we were comparing phenobarbital and bromide as first choice ep epileptic, sorry. So he was randomly assigned bromide, and what we did in these patients is we loaded them so that they got to therapeutic concentrations on day seven, whether it was phenobarbital or bromide, and then what we did is we measured them post-load, and then then we measured them monthly to make sure that their uh, concentration stayed within um, what they achieved for the therapeutic range. So um, what I want you to see is his baseline at month four was 1.5 milligrams per mil. Uh, the client calls my tech up in the middle of the night on a Sunday night, and this dog is in cluster seizures. And so the first thing we do is we measure his bromide, and his bromide is 0.5 mg per mil. Now, we had just measured him a week prior, and that's when he was at 1.5 mg per mil. Bromide has a half-life of 21 days. There's no way this could be a compliance issue. There's no way that this can be anything other than something has caused that bromide to clear. And and I could not figure out what it was until he told me that this dog was, they were on the coast and the dog played in the beach that day and drank so much seawater that he vomited. And we all know that increasing chloride causes the kidney to get rid of bromide. And I think this is just an example of what happens when a dog that's on bromide therapy drinks salt water. We cause the bromide to be eliminated. And the reason that we could show that this was the problem is because we had a baseline. Um, there are a couple of other neat cases in here, and I'll just encourage you to uh, look at them. And I have some neat immune modulator cases as well. But this was a patient that was on both bromide and phenobarbital. It was a um, difficult to control anti, uh, difficult to control epileptic. Um, so they had monitored the bromide and it was two mg per mil. They had monitored um, previously, let me go back. They had monitored the um, phenobarbital and it was 32 micrograms per mil. And they had monitored the bromide um, prior and it was 0.9 mg per mil. The problem is that this patient who's on both phenobarbital at a relatively high concentration and on bromide 
um, is presented for respiratory infection and the, the veterinarian treats it with chlorophenicol and a week later, this dog is more abundant. Everybody's thinking, well, this is liver disease. So the first thing we do is we measure the bromide and for whatever reason now the bromide has doubled. No good reason for that at the dose, but this is now about six months later. So it may be a dietary change no talent, but that certainly can be contributing to the animal being more abundant. But we look at his phenobarb and it was last week, it was 32 micrograms per mil. Luckily, the clients had just measured it. Well, today it is 50 micrograms per mil. And so we're pretty much convinced this is not liver disease. This is because the patient was put on chlorophenicol, which inhibits the metabolism of phenobarbital. So all we did is we told the client, uh, the veterinarian, take the dog off uh, chloramphenicol to wait a couple of days and that drug concentration should um, actually decrease and it did. So I'm going to have to end here because I have to go to my noon meeting, but I'll encourage you to look at these other cases. What I'll really encourage you to do is to think about how we can use monitoring to help answer, especially with the powerful tools of population kinetics, how we can answer questions about what impacts drug concentrations and reach out to Kamal Teep and Tom to see if you you can't come up with other ideas to use this data. And I'm looking forward to Claire helping us make sense out of our immune modulator data as well. Thank you, Don. And um, next month we have Mark Papich. I think it's the fourth, but the first Thursday, and that will wrap up the seminar series for the year. So. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. Take care. And if you want to email me, email me. I'd be, love to have the discussions.